Good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, I welcome you uh, to the EMEA webinar co-organized uh, uh, with the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels on uh, COVID-19 pandemic, war and stagflation. How can countries in the Mediterranean and Africa respond? Uh, so I'll, I'll start with a short introduction on uh, the current situation uh, that we are living today. Now, uh, looking at the April uh, 2022 uh, World Economic Outlook, uh, which was published by the International Monetary Fund uh, this, uh, this month, it is clear that there is a uh, serious challenges that we are seeing uh, that are uh, impacting the uh, global economic recovery, mainly slowing growth and uh, high inflation and that is also called stagflation, uh, that will hit uh, the global economy uh, also uh, in view of the uh, war uh, in Ukraine that has started uh, a couple of months ago, which has really put a clear disruption on uh, the economic recovery uh, post-COVID-19. Uh, now, of course, uh, we have seen that uh, prices of energy uh, have soared, uh, also the food prices, and what is uh, worrying uh, are the geopolitical uncertainties raising conflicts and also uh, the seemingly uh, fragmentations between the different policies of uh, different uh, geopolitical players. Now, in the meanwhile, uh, many countries uh, in the uh, Mediterranean and Africa are very much uh, suffering or have been suffering already from uh, the pandemic uh, because they also have some weak economic fundamentals and uh, most importantly, uh, the growing uh, stock uh, of sovereign debt, uh, but not only sovereign debt, but we are also seeing that the private debt is increasing which uh, grant them very low fiscal space to uh, provide buffers to stabilize economies uh, and also even to honor their financial uh, obligations. Now, uh, if we, we, we look at uh, one of the main issues that probably we need, to, uh, we need to assess in the coming months, as I mentioned, is the fast uh, growing of the uh, private uh, debt uh, of companies worldwide. And this will also probably could act as a, uh, a drag on growth uh, within the pressures that we are seeing of uh, increasing interest rates globally uh, to tackle uh, the ri rising inflation, which also will reduce uh, overall spending and investment if we would like to move uh, or at least to resume uh, a global recovery. Uh, we have seen also that the IMF during the spring meetings uh, that are still happening or they already uh, been finalized, uh, they have downgraded uh, their forecasts on uh, growth in most countries. And then they are accepting that we are moving into a much gloomier global economic outlook. Um, now we... Our global economy is poised with pandemics still because we are not over from the COVID. Now there is a war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, of course, there will be subsequent economic and financial crisis. Um, and as I mentioned, the uncertainties uh, are very much increasing and the fragmentations uh, between the different uh, geopolitical players, it's, uh, it's increasing as well. Uh, we also see that the, this will weight uh, negatively on a global, cooperation, uh, global cooperation and eventually coordination. Uh, for sure, this will uh, make global solutions and agreements uh, difficult to, to reach, particularly uh, at the G20 where uh, it is happening in uh, Indonesia. Now, as I mentioned, uh, many countries in the Mediterranean and Africa will have very little buffers uh, and they will pay hefty prices because of the increasing energy prices and also uh, of food prices. Now, how to address these problems? What can uh, countries in the Mediterranean and Africa uh, could do, particularly the ones that are not prepared at all for this new crisis? Uh, they have uh, already uh, accumulated some very low uh, fiscal spaces uh, to achieve, in fact, uh, 
increasing poverty. We have seen the reports of the World Bank that there has been an, a big increase of poverty in those countries, also hunger. And uh, we've seen also uh, some social uh, unrest. Uh, the war uh, in Ukraine has very much exacerbated uh, an already fragile uh, economic outlook, uh, weakened by successive uh, waves of uh, pandemic, and also put at the surface a major and very worrying uh, geopolitical misalignment and uh, fragmentations. Now, uh, these countries, which are pra practically the majority of them in the Mediterranean in Africa, they belong to the low uh, and middle income uh, countries. They may lack the policy options, maneuvers, uh, after having stretched already uh, their possibilities during uh, the pandemic. So they have very little buffers to really uh, you know, address the problems of the uh, energy crisis and, uh, and the food crisis. Now, the questions are, will they have to diversify uh, their suppliers? Will they have to start local productions? For example, uh, knowing that the cost and the risks of these productions will be much higher, particularly if they are not prepared for it. So these are really major questions for these regions to, 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 to address and who is going to be able to address and to support those countries. Now, looking at the north part, which is Europe, uh, mostly exposed to, to the Ukraine uh, war. And also we've seen over the past weeks and months uh, that they have been struggling to reduce their reliance on uh, Russian energy imports. Uh, of course, they had to uh, respond uh, with, uh, to this with uh, some major sanctions on Russia and so on. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, they are called to accelerate the transition to a clean, uh, a green economy. This is also potentially an opportunity to, uh, to uh, fi finish with the reliance on fossil fuel in their economies. However, um, to respond at the short-term risks of energy crisis that we've seen in some European Mediterranean uh, countries, for example, Italy and others, have uh, rushed to introduce or reintroduce the coal in their energy mix. And also uh, some of them, uh, they have rushed, uh, rushed to uh, sign some new deals uh, with um, fossil fuel with uh, other countries like, for example, Algeria. Now, uh, probably these new deals may boost the energy uh, sectors uh, in this part of the world, but, but then at the same time, we need to really think that uh, the world and the planet is needing to move into a green transition and to reduce the reliance on, uh, on the fossil uh, fuel. Now, with all these elements that are quite complex uh, and the interactions between them, it's very uncertain and we might not even have the answers, uh, this will guide our discussion uh, today. Now, as I mentioned, this webinar, which is in collaboration with SEPS, uh, will discuss the current state of affairs uh, during this very uncertain times. Um, and also we try to focus on the impacts and what can the Mediterranean and African countries uh, do. Uh, so um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, the panelists today. Uh, so before we start, I would like to mention a few points, which are the logistics. Uh, the webinar uh, content and discussions are uh, public and are live uh, broadcasted on Facebook. Uh, our team later on will uh, publish a, uh, a recording of the webinar and a report that will summarize the main conclusions. Uh, also, for all participants, please write your questions, comments on the Q&A box, and uh, then we can share them with you uh, today. So let me start. Um, this, um, this discussion will have uh, two uh, rounds. Uh, the first round is to discuss, uh, discuss the current state of affairs and what, uh, what are the main uncertainties, what are the main challenges, and also what are the main uh, opportunities uh, that we could see? This is really uh, the present. And the second round would be, what is the future? What are the solutions? What are the scenarios eventually? And what can we expect in the next months and years uh, in this context? 
So I would uh, be very happy to welcome uh, Sensia Sidi. Sensia, uh, she's the director of research at the Center for European uh, Policy Studies. Uh, she's an international expert on the European economy, on macroeconomics and uh, international economics. And she's uh, a member of the executive uh, board of the Euro Mediterranean Economist Association. So, Cynthia, we all all uh, years to listen to you on the situation uh, in Europe and how do you see the implications for the Mediterranean and Africa? Please, the, the floor and the screen is yours. Many thanks, uh, Rim, for, for the nice introduction. Uh, I prepared a few slides uh, just to uh, support a uh, few statements I want to make with uh, uh, some data. Let me share the screen. Uh, Okay, can you please confirm that you can see my full screen with the slide? Okay, um, so uh, as, as Rim uh, mentioned, we are in a situation really of uh, uh, extremely high uncertainty. And uh, uh, if you want, so maybe this is a simplified picture, but uh, I think there are three main sources of uh, uncertainty for current, uh, situation, but also in a more forward-looking way. The first one is, of course, the, the, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine and the fact that uh, um, the war and the sanctions which have been applied to Russia have created a lot of uncertainty around commodity markets and commodity supply. So it's both about prices and, and supply. And we are seeing really a high risk of disruption. The second element is that basically, especially in advanced economies, but actually it's not only the EU and the US, inflation is basically at 40 year high. This is a completely new environment that brings us back almost 40 years in the 70s, basically after the oil shock. Um, so this means that the policies which have been in place for several years, and in particular, the very um, supportive post-COVID measures may be challenged in the sense that they may not be may not be remain in place for, for long for several reasons which actually will explain in a moment the last one is that the uh, the war has uh, attracted all attention but covid is still around i mean of course the, the impact in terms of uh, um, deaths is, is much lower uh, but we are also seeing that in china where the zero covid policy is, is already in, in place even small numbers can generate big disruption. We all have in mind all these uh, congested uh, ports uh, um, in Asia where uh, you have a lot of containers which uh, cannot move. Now, um, let me focus on, uh, on, on the conflict. And basically, again, I'm, I'm simplifying a lot, but the, given the complexity of the situation, we really need, need to, to try to identify few uh, key channel, uh, channels of uh, transmission mechanisms, so the way through which the global economy is affected. The first one is financial sanctions. Uh, we mentioned it, uh, I will not have the time to go uh, into this. Second one is supply disruption, which are sometimes due to logistics. The fact that certain logistics are not anymore in place. Uh, think of uh, uh, sea freight routes from, from Ukraine, or the, the fact that basically, um, some of the storage of wheat in Ukraine is not accessible anymore, uh, but also restriction on uh, air links. So uh, these are disruption which are really physical, if you want, uh, which are induced by the war. And then the third aspect, and I want to focus on, on this, is really what is happening to commodities, both in terms of supply and, and prices, uh, and I want to focus on energy and, and food. Um, these are two very different commodities, but I think if we want to look at what is happening in Europe and in Africa, we can actually draw quite some parallel uh, by looking at, at these two commodities. Now, let me start with uh, energy. And uh, here I have a couple of charts where uh, basically try to give a sense of how strong is reliance on important energy supply from, from Russia. I mean, these are two dif different charts. One is from the IMF, directly taken from the, the last wheel, and the second one is from, uh, from the OECD. They measure in different ways uh, the energy imports from, uh, from Russia as a percentage of total imports and as a percentage of total energy supply. 
But basically, uh, taking all the countries into consideration, it's clear that the most of the dependency is for European countries. And then you have some Euro Eurasia countries. Uh, but it, it's clear that uh, EU countries are the most exposed. Uh, things are uh, evolving quite quickly, but uh, in fact, until a couple of months ago, Russia was providing about 40% of European natural gas import uh, to, to the European countries. So uh, it, it's clear that if there is a disruption, it's not easy to, 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 to change the situation. Now, uh, going back to one of the last points that the RIM said is that I think the long-term solution is quite clear to, to everyone. I mean, uh, reliance on this will give really the opportunity to reduce reliance on fossil fuels in, in general, not only on uh, Russian gas, but this will take time because we really need to, to build um, something different. Uh, the main question is really for the short term and how costly uh, actually actually will be to, to reduce such reliance. But at the same time, even to, to keep reliance on, um, on, on Russia, given that the, uh, the, the price of, of gas has hugely increased. Um, I prepared this, this chart. These are spot prices for uh, natural gas Europe, which is different from the one in, in, in the US, and for the crude oil. And basically, if we look at really over 17 years, we have seen a lot of spikes. I mean, in, in fact, for oil, we are not uh, yet, at least this was this is until 31st of March 2022, and then where we were basically at the time of Lehman. But for the price of gas, the, you can clearly see the, uh, the incredible price in, uh, increase in, in, in prices. And basically, there is missing some 20% more, which happened just yesterday. Um, so we are really talking about very exceptional um, dynamics in, 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 in prices, uh, which are mostly driven by uncertainty. So this, this, and this is the major issue for Europe. The second point I want to highlight is moving to food. And uh, basically here what I show is, this is a FAO data, is the, the, the reliance on imported wheat from Russia and Ukraine. And what you can see in this list of, of countries is basically most of them are, are African countries. And uh, you see at the bottom, like Eritrea or Somalia, where the dependency putting together, again, uh, Ukraine and Russia is above 90%. Uh, I mean, we need to be aware that basically in 2021, one, one quarter of world, world's wheat was exported by uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. Uh, which are also major exporter of other um, uh, uh, commodities and of fertilizers. Fertilizers are actually an important issue, uh, an important element, because uh, they can have a huge impact on uh, uh, production of, uh, um, of crops uh, uh, locally. Um, so this basically, this is to say that uh, the, the entire region, uh, the African region, is is very vulnerable to rise in, in, in food prices, but also in disruption in, in supply. And basically, in response to, to, to food security concerns, some countries are even moving to implementing uh, protectionistic policies. This, this becomes uh, um, inevitable. So, for instance, some countries are not exporting anymore, uh, even if they are net. Um, importers that were still importing to some neighbor countries and this basically a cutting on, on, on this uh, in order really to, to, to reduce the impact of, of rising prices. But this may actually risk to exacerbate pressures on um, other countries. So the, the issue of uh, food prices and in particular um, uh, driven by commodity prices is going to be a major one for, for Africa. This is just to, to give you an idea of uh, uh, what is happening with, with prices? Uh, this is, I put uh, uh, the, the yellow one is the general indicator for food prices worldwide, and uh, um, the green one is, is wheat. Uh, and as you can see, again, if we look at it in a long term perspective, uh, we are basically now at levels which are higher than the global financial crisis, where there was basically a major peak, uh, and also higher than the Arab Spring time. And we know what happened when. Uh, um, basically, the uh, wheat prices in uh, uh, increase and what kind of, of social consequences uh, this this could have. 
So uh, we are already at a higher level than, uh, than that. I mean, of course, it, it depends on how long this, uh, this, this will stay. Let me conclude uh, um, uh, this introduction with, uh, with a couple of points. The first one, if we want to think of what could happen in the future, I think is uh, we need to, to ask uh, um, basically how long is the war and what a long war would mean. I think the length of the war is actually a crucial issue. I mean, of course, there are humanitarian, there's a humanitarian expert. Uh, there are some aspects which are particularly relevant for, for Europe because basically it's the most exposed on uh, basically not only the energy prices, which in any case will remain high, but uh, Europe has received more than 5 million uh, people. Uh, so a long war, it means that uh, these people cannot go back. These are people who would like to go back as soon as possible. Uh, but the, the longer the war, the longer they will remain. And this will bring political pressures. Second one is a long war will keep uncertainty high. And if uncertainty uh, remains high, price will continue to soar, or at best, will remain very volatile. Last aspect, which is I think is very uh, relevant in the, the potential cooperation and issues between Africa and uh, uh, in, in general and, and Europe, is that because of food prices, the war can have second round effect and generate social distress and political risks in, in the region including potentially new migration flows to, to Europe. And for a more global perspective, I think from an economic point of view, there is a serious issue of stagflation. I mean, stagflation is uh, that nasty situation where basically you have high inflation and low growth. And why this is a risk? I think that uh, it's very much linked to, to, to what is happening and the rule for maneuver of policies. Now, uh, we expect that uh, Fiscal policy will remain expansionary. I think it's the, it's very unlikely that the country will uh, move to a contractionary fiscal policy to the extent they have room, of course. Uh, but this is now is seen as something which will just not work. I think that in Europe will remain somewhat automatically expansionary because uh, there will be a support to refugees. Military expenditure will increase after 70 years. And uh, there will be compensations uh, for higher energy uh, prices and uh, higher energy, uh, high food prices. So, in, in a sense, uh, um, I think that fiscal policy has to remain expansionary. But of course, there are limits, and some countries will hit the, the, the roof, both in Europe and outside. Um, the second point is the pressure on monetary policy. So this is really the link between uh, the, the war, if you want, the current context and uh, monetary policy. Now, there is a huge pressure uh, in the US, and now also in, in Europe, to curb inflation. And the interest rates will start to rise. And, and we know that especially um, if the Fed increases interest rates, there may be consequences on emerging and developing economies because of the denomination of assets and in particular of debt and potential uh, change in uh, capital flows. Um, I, I will stop it here and then I'm, I'm happy to elaborate further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. I have one uh, question uh, which you alluded at. Uh, it's about increasing interest rate. And we know very much that uh, Europe has been going through a pandemic where uh, there has been uh, an increase in uh, public uh, expenditures, of course, via fiscal policy. But then at the same time, because of the uh, stopping of the activities, economic activities in certain sectors, uh, the potential uh, perform uh, non-performing uh, loans in certain banks and also uh, companies um, might increase because what this is what we call the stage two type of credits. Uh, now, increasing interest rate also means that the mortgages and credits will become much more expensive. And then this, since we do not have the recovery because the, the economic recovery has been disrupted, then this might put a huge pressure on small and medium sized companies and companies uh, overall to uh, really, uh, you know, support the economic recovery if it were to uh, to resume. So how, how do you see this? Who, who will who will pay the bill for this? I mean, this, this is, of course, a risk. Huh? Uh, this is um, a major risk and a major trade-off that, uh, that the European Central Bank, but also the, 
the U.S. is facing. I mean, today the, the, the data for the U.S. came out and basically uh, it's the first uh, quarter uh, since basically the pandemic uh, that uh, the um, uh, GDP um, is showing some, some sign of, of, of decline. So I think this is a, a major trade-off that uh, the central banks will have to, to face. But uh, given that basically expected inflation in the EU area for this year is 5.1%, it has become really impossible for the ECB, which has the mandate of price stability, uh, not to intervene. So uh, and now the, the expectations that uh, uh, interest rates will increase is that uh, this will happen basically around summer. Now, the, the, of course, the central bank will try to uh, communicate and to, to make sure that this happen in, in the smoothest way, uh, way uh, possible. But the effect that you des described in terms of increasing interest rates on, um, on loans uh, is likely to happen. Um, again, this will be a major change because basically we have got accustomed to, to, to pay zero interest rate or very similar in, uh, in advanced economies. This is going to be a major change. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia. Uh, I would like to move uh, straight to uh, the second panelist. Um, Professor Moaz Labidi, he is a professor of economics at the Faculty of Economics and Management of uh, Mahdia, which is in Tunisia. Uh, he is also the research director at the Development uh, Financier and Innovation uh, in Tunisia as well. And he is member of the Associate Committee of the EU Mediterranean and African Network for Economic uh, Studies, MNS, uh, which is coordinated by uh, Europe. Euro-Mediterranean Economist Association. Uh, Moaz has been working very much on issues related to monetary policy, uh, banking sector, uh, also debt, uh, uh, also issues related to financial inclusion and, uh, and climate change and so on. And he has been quite active in the debate on uh, the current uh, economic situation of Tunisia. Uh, so, Moaz, uh, we are all wanting to listen to you about the situation of Tunisia, uh, as you heard in this context that, uh, that Cynthia uh, has, uh, has uh, alluded at. Uh, thank you, uh, Rim, so much for, for the introduction. Uh, I'm honored to, uh, to, to be here uh, with you. And uh, the Russian war uh, against uh, Ukraine introduced today a, a new risk onto the pre existing uh, ones created and uh, exacerbated by, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, I told you I can share. Now let me uh, let me start to by the situation of uh, Tunisia, uh, Tunisia of Tunisian economy in, in the context uh, of the, the pandemic and after the Ukraine crisis. Uh, if we uh, if we distinguish between advanced economy and uh, and the Tunisian economy, uh, we can say in the face of the cyclical uh, shocks, advanced economy and emerging economies uh, have a strong resilience. But uh, while uh, for the case of Tunisia, the uh, pandemic uh, shock, the pandemic shock, Tunisia have a weak resilience. The, the, debt, level, the, the debt ratio is, is very high, in, uh, about 20% of GDP in 2019. Today is about uh, 80, uh, uh, 85%. And uh, for the systemic uh, shocks, uh, advanced economy are uh, not sufficient uh, resilient and uh, uh, Tunisia is not uh, is not resilient. So face it to the COVID uh, COVID nineteen, uh, we see a, a big difference. Uh, 
big difference between uh, the uh, advanced economies and uh, Tunisia. Uh, and uh, the difference, the difference is in in fiscal space and in the cost of, uh, uh, of financing. When we uh, compare uh, for the advanced economies and emerging economies, uh, the fiscal space is at the high uh, level uh, that this country have a strong capacity of uh, and the cost uh, and the, the cost of financing. Uh, was near zero since the, the Great Recession in 2008, which is the result of the interest rate, uh, zero interest rate policy, negative interest rate policy, then this country have uh, a high capacity, uh, uh, debt uh, capacity. So in this context, the advanced uh, country, advanced uh, uh, economies and emerging uh, economies uh, have initiated an ambitious recovery plan, which include the increase of the level of social expenditure, which include uh, the ecological transition and the digital uh, transition. And the result is we have a, a V uh, shaped uh, recovery, so the growth rate exceeds uh, 6%. On the other side, in Tunisia, uh, the fiscal space has, uh, has, has been restricted. Uh, the government has low capacity to, uh, to, of intervention and uh, the cost of uh, uh, financing is at the very high uh, level. Uh, the spread, for example, in the, uh, in the financial market, exceed 2,000 basis points uh, for, the, for the sovereign bonds in, in, uh, in dollar and 3,000 uh, basis points in, uh, in euro. And the IMF talk about, uh, about the risk of debt and sustainability. So with limited fiscal space, with the, the high level of, uh, uh, level of interest rate, Tunisia don't have the ability to, to initiate a, uh, an ambitious recovery uh, plan uh, and uh, have a, a have any inability to, to meet the need of social uh, expenditure. And the result, L-shaped recovery, the growth rate between two and 3%. And today, the growth rate is, about, uh, is at 3.1% uh, for uh, 2021. No, Moaz, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you at all. This is what I'm trying to uh, tell you. Uh, so I think we, I need to move to the next uh, speaker, I'm afraid, because we don't hear you at all. Okay, thank you, Moaz, for, uh, for, for what we could listen. It's an excellent presentation. Uh, I think we understood a bit the message. Um, but unfortunately, the internet connection on your side uh, is not uh, working. So uh, I would like to move uh, straight away to the next uh, panelist, uh, Nagla Bahar. Uh, Nagla, she is the managing director of the credit guarantee company. Uh, CGC in Egypt since 2015. Uh, Nagla, she is also the chairwoman of the Euro Mediterranean Guarantee Network. Um, and then uh, she has a wide experience uh, in finance, economic development, uh, strategic planning uh, for emerging market development and all for our region. Uh, so, of course, her main expertise on the small and medium sized enterprises and also uh, the use of guarantee schemes to, uh, to manage uh, the risks. And we see, for example, as I mentioned before, 
uh, that these conditions that we have living, the macroeconomic conditions in our region, uh, we've seen that uh, there are serious macroeconomic risks that could also translate into uh, the economies uh, to become uh, a specific economic risk to sectors and so on. So please, uh, Nagla, uh, we're very happy to have you with us today and the, the floor uh, and the screen is yours. So the case of Egypt would be very interesting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reem, actually, for the introduction and for raising the topic and enabling all of us, you know, to share our practices and the experience uh, or short experience in light of the Ukraine uh, war, actually. But uh, with the pandemic, of course, you know, we, uh, we, we were able uh, to overcome the pandemic, I think, you know, and its crisis uh, in Egypt and mostly in the region. And uh, I can say that uh, we succeeded in doing that. But before, actually, we just go back to normal, we have this uh, war and its effect on us. Um, I will link what I'm saying, as you said, you know, to, to, to the guarantee and not only the guarantee as, um, as the instrument, but it is an important instrument that is supporting an extremely important segment in our economy which is the small and medium enterprises, you know, which is dominating most of uh, the economies of, uh, of uh, our region. And I think most of the regions, you know, not only us. And um, uh, a segment that could be easily affected by what's going on. It had been already affected by what was going on with the COVID, but um, successfully, uh, thanks God, we were all able in most of the regions, you know, our region and the, the European region and the African and the others, you know, to overcome um, the uh, effect of the COVID by applying uh, different measures, by going out of our norm. Uh, we've already changed it ourselves drastically on the way we're doing the business during uh, those uh, last two years. And uh, we were heading this year, the 2022, to uh, actually uh, work on uh, on our new uh, business and operational model. You know, to 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 work with what was after the uh, effect or the post uh, pandemic effect, because we all know that despite the fact we 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 met the immediate call for intervening to save the economies and to ensure that the business has an ongoing nature, despite uh, the lockdowns or the semi-lockdowns and the other effects of supply chain and the others, uh, we, we knew that actually that would take us some time to back to the norm. And that requested from us as guarantee schemes to change our models and the way of, of doing the business to not only now uh, assisting the segment of the small and medium enterprises, which is the core of all the economies, but also other affected uh, uh, segments because uh, we're involving corporate, for example, now, and we're dealing with the effect of, of uh, the economic status on corporates. We've in, we're involving sectors by from A to Z, like tourism, for example, you know, irrelevant of the size of business. So uh, uh, now actually with the supply chain also, we started to work on different models to tackle the effect of the supply chain and to enable uh, facilitating uh, access to finance at preferential uh, terms and conditions with the involvement of the guarantee scheme as a risk mitigation tool. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we've been working on, you mentioned the uh, 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 being, you know, the green and the climate status and how this is affecting everything, including uh, including agriculture, including everything. So we were, we're working currently as guarantee schemes to develop new uh, model or product to, to deal with the climate, with the green and with the sustainability. Um, so there are lots of challenges, you know, that our, our, our uh, work, you know, uh, we are facing and lots of challenges that by themselves, they are not enough to be a challenge, but dynamic challenges, you know, and uh, changing every day. Having on top of that, you know, the effect of um, the Ukraine-Russian war, and to talk about the southern part of the Mediterranean and the Egypt, you know, we're far away from that, but unfortunately, it is not the, uh, the destination 
it is actually the economic relationship. So in Egypt, we are relying almost uh, 80% of our wheat uh, uh, consumption. We're getting it from Ukraine and Russia. And uh, of course, uh, what uh, the war of Ukraine and Russia having an uh, effect on uh, wheat and on grain and on uh, oil pricing and on question mark about the private capital flow, <coughs> of course, on tourism. And uh, and remittance because uh, w- in Egypt, you know, we used to receive lots of Russians and Ukraini uh, uh, people uh, for uh, tourism in Egypt. So it, and being out of the pandemic, okay, succeeded in passing it, but still overwhelmed with its effect on our economy and monetary policy and on our uh, uh, central bank. Even you know, uh, uh, um, policies had to change to meet all of that. In Egypt, immediately, of course, after we faced that, just last month, you know, the central bank came down to uh, uh, talk about the, firstly, there was um, uh, a kind of devalue, again, you know, within our Egyptian uh, pound dollar, and we had to do that to meet the effect on monetary policy. At the same time, actually, uh, we started to look at different venues, you know, to get uh, our uh, need from wheat and grain. And this is at a price, of course, increased the prices and all. At the same time, you know, we started to look at our subsidy uh, plan in Egypt. We looked at it and we increased in areas, but we started to uh, uh, decrease some subsidies that were not uh, uh, important. Uh, for the meantime. At the same time, actually, uh, we started at the level of uh, 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 guarantee. Uh, There are different programs that had been immediately established. Uh, One of them, because we we looked at our imports-export relationship and the need of of foreign currency. And uh, there were kind of uh, some regulations and rules had been issued at that level to limit some of the imports and to find and substitution at the level of local products. Here we started to intervene as guarantee, providing uh, better facilities, you know, for those who are aiming at substituting uh, uh, imports, particularly in area of, uh, because you mentioned uh, fertilizer, and uh, really we started to work hardly into that. We started to ease or to relax some of um, uh, to, 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 uh, of the non-performing actually SMEs. We needed to work with them, and we find ways of enabling them uh, to 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 back to business. Uh, we started applying a number of equity programs to uh, assist not only finance; it's finance plus. There is a clear focus on programs about jobs and facility, maintaining the jo- jobs of people or creating new jobs for the young, uh, because um, we all know eventually the economic, whatever going, could affect the social status. So we're, we're looking at that. And there are a number of programs that had been issued at that level. A number of committees had been established uh, involving all parties and stakeholders uh, to work upon the crisis, you know, and again, uh, with uh, for to to meet the crisis uh, effect, and uh, um, the, we 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 kind of despite Ramadan and despite fasting and despite everything, we're kind of non-stop meetings and initiating all these programs, and with a real focus of maintaining the ongoing status of the economy, finding substitution to our main producers of wheat and grain, we did some, but at a cost, of course. We all know that Egypt already had started to negotiate another uh, uh, loan you know, from IMF. Uh, we are really trying uh, to work out how to balance the social through the small and medium enterprises. At the guarantee scheme, we changed drastically everything we're working with. We waived lots of things that we need to waive in terms of timing, in terms of lower uh, fees, in terms of higher coverage to encourage banks, you know, to facilitate this finance despite despite the high risk that is associated with the businesses asking for this. 
sector of tourism, of course, we're back with another uh, fund to support the tourism sector again to overcome uh, this uh, drop. And um, very soon we will be meeting, you know, to, uh, to, with, with some initiatives at the level of the agriculture as well. So, yes, there is a crisis and a bigger crisis than, than the one before, or maybe having the two of them twinned together made it like that. The effect is very clear. GDP, of course, um, expectations are expected to go down, not, not as expected. I think uh, the IMF was expecting like an 5.8 and now it came down like a 5% for the region, including Egypt. And um, so, um, yeah, crisis, we have uncertainty level. We don't know to plan for how long. Uh, but th there are some um, small and at, at, at a local level, actually, and I am sure that there should be something that it should be a regional level. This is what we need to look at. But at a local level, immediate actions had been taken to uh, absorb the uh, reaction of, of the crisis and the guarantee had been an uh, integral part of all the initiatives that came considering the segment of the small and medium enterprises and the other segments of other uh, industries that had been affected badly by that, as I said, the tourism, uh, distribution, and uh, of course trade, you know, all these segments we are dealing with, we're trying to maintain their businesses as much as we can until we reach any clear idea about when this will stop and um, we can plan accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nagla. I think you also uh, confirmed the point that uh, Cynthia has mentioned, which is really the timing of this uh, war, uh, which will have really serious costs and implications on the countries in the Mediterranean region. And also you mentioned the importance of the use of guarantees uh, as a, an a shock absorber. Uh, and I think this is what we've seen it uh, also during the pandemic uh, and now during the, uh, during the uh, uh, consequence of the wars, uh, the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so probably we need to have a reflection, a regional reflection on how guarantees uh, could act as shock ab absorbers in, uh, in the Mediterranean region. Uh, so yes, this is a reflection that we could, uh, we, we, we could put forward uh, under our uh, network. Uh, thank you very much again, Nagla, for your, uh, your comments. And then we, we, we move on into another country uh, with uh, our colleague uh, Kwame Safrong Bamier. He's a partner uh, at the KPMG uh, Ghana. Uh, he's an expert uh, on audit, of course, uh, and uh, risk and compliance. Uh, very much uh, huge experience on, uh, on uh, internal audit, uh, of course, uh, governance and compliance. Um, I think you have a, a great experience to share with us in the case of uh, in the case of Ghana and maybe other countries in uh, in Africa. Knowing what we heard from uh, from Cynthia on the overall situation, so how do you see uh, how do you see the development in Ghana and what were uh, the what was the current situation? Please, uh, Kwame, the uh, screen is yours and the floor is yours. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, doctor and all panelists. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I'll, yes. yes, I want to show my face and then if it's okay, I'll take down my video because of the internet issue. I think, I think the, a lot has been said with regards to the impact that uh, we, we, we are having from post COVID and also this whole discussion around um, what Ukraine war uh, what Russia has done to us, I think, uh, has done to us. I think, I think it's clear that it, it's a major challenge to all of us. Um, some of the impact, I mean, for me, I'll just mention a few. Uh, Egypt, for instance, supports the region a lot with um, food, food exports, right? And that support comes from its ability to get some of these uh, inputs from Russia and Ukraine, especially when it comes to um, um, fertilizer and, and other things like that. Um, food prices have gone up, fuel prices, I think is, is a global dynamic. And 
we in Africa are facing that. But I think in Africa, the, the story is even a bit harsher because uh, we already were in a gap in terms of debt and COVID came, what's in the situation. And now this post COVID era, which has kind of slowed down. And that's why I think we are calling for the st whole stagflation discussion point, right? Now, I mean, th there's an excellent point that was just made in terms of uh, individual countries that are taking steps. And, and, and basically what I want to do is basically just speak on my thoughts on what I think countries should be doing, what they're doing, and then more importantly, I had a point about regional, the direction, which is super, super, because if you look at the COVID uh, issue that we experienced, I think one of the main issues that we, we had was not taking a more collaborative approach. And so now I think if we think regional faster, it's better. An excellent point was also made with regards to when the war will be over. I think it's a strong point that must be looked at because for me, we should work with the assumption that if this war is over, there could be another challenge. So what are some of the things that will make us sustainable and that we can do with these shocks? Because these shocks are typically normal, right? And, and will not necessarily go, go away. I think Nigeria has taken a bold step. I mean, with regards to fertilizer, where they are looking to move away from the import dependency on fertilizer. And, and that's a huge, huge uh, um, step. Uh, small scale far farmers in, in Africa are so important <laughs> because they, if you look at cocoa, for instance, in Ghana, these are produced by small scale farmers and they are consolidated at the national level to sell, to put Ghana the, on the map of being the number two or, or number one cocoa supplier. So a deeper full focus on these small scale farmers to improve their outputs is one. Major investments in, in, in terms of power distribution. I think power is a major issue that we have, but then going into energy efficient power, the right power for Africa is something that I think the discussion must be. Now, I think that this Russia-Ukraine war is uh, an opportunity for, for us to respond more effectively to the whole, the, these things. Now, uh, there has been significant downgrades. It's very really Ghana, for instance, got that downgraded. Some institutions in Ghana, banks got downgraded. And this impact on the country as a whole, the economy as a whole is so huge. So how does the country and regionally look at having better economic outlook? I think domestic credit rating agencies are something that are about to start. It's not really here yet. So we, we're still gonna I mean, rely on Europe and others to kind of assess our performance and we need to really get that right to ensure that, uh, that the economic shocks are minimal and that we have the right ratings to tap and make the economy stronger. I think um, ESG is just something that is, is booming, is storming, is, is getting so much noise. The part that I, I really like is the governance part, right? We need to really look at that whole sustainability sense. And I, I, I mean, when I go to what Europe can do for Africa, I'll, I'll, I'll speak more about ready to order. But I think the governance part is we must, as Africa and as uh, regional partners, look at how we hold ourselves accountable and put the right people and have the right mix of people, men versus women, diversity, approach that directly because if we have the right accountability and the right governance process, I think it's going to really help us save us some of these shocks. Now here is really looking at the reality and, 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 and what we can do from, from, I mean, Europe and others to, to really support. I think debt facilities are, are too stringent in terms of, and, and I'm not saying that Europe and other, others should just throw money at Africa. They should give that money through a lens of something called ready to audit framework or frameworks that gives them the comfort of where the money is going, how the money is being used, but then have the ability after getting all that information to reduce some of these stringent positions, right? We must sequence the agenda. I mean, with regards to the, the, the things that will give us the maximum benefit, Th things that go on sustainable uh, processes, not just put money to where political gains will, will, I mean, will come in. I mean, this is really um, something that's hurting us. So, uh, I mean, for me, you, Europe, uh, IMF and other players can play a systemic role 
in, in, in supporting the global economy, specifically Africa in becoming sustainable to manage these shocks? Because that question about when the war will end, I think there will be some war, not necessarily a war, but there'll, there'll be some shock every couple of years. And Africa must be ready to respond to these shocks. And it includes our an overhaul of, of, of our economic setup, an overhaul of how uh, FDIs are used and managed, an overhaul of how debt is managed. I mean, there's discussions around debt transparency. It's an important one that must be looked at and Africa must embrace it, it must be the lead in the discussion to ensure that we have uh, clarity on, on, on what is going. So these are my thoughts. Uh, I'll leave it to Raymond and team for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kwame. Um, also, I wanted to uh, ask you uh, to react to this uh, mac new macroeconomic uh, challenges. Um, Ghana also had to devalue its currency uh, lately. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit on, on, on the responses uh, by Ghana uh, to respond to those economic challenges? Sure, sure. So I'm not sure it was a formal action to devalue the currency. It was just a, a, a thing of the market playing out where the currency got hit significantly in a very short period of time, around uh, March and February. Now, I think one of the main issues is the import co cover, the, the, the downgrade that I mentioned that came through for, for us, and, and, and just um, the, the the central bank and the ministry of finance in terms of managing liquidity availability i think uh there's been a strong response from the government and and we've seen some stability in the last three weeks where uh, it's still very high but it's not moving uh, i mean as it was because for about five weeks or so every month i mean every day was like a an uncertainty but now i think there's more direction in terms of confidence around um revenue sources. I mean, there was a huge lockup in parliament where the government was trying to pass a bill, something called e-levy, basically to be able to task um, on, on uh, electronic transactions. I mean, the, our, our parliament is so uh, close in terms of majority and minority that it, it took forever to pass that bill. And I think it really caused a bit of a shock in terms of the outlook and all these contributed to the to the, 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 the exchange rate. But now I think uh, it's, it's been passed. There's assurance on some revenue sources. Uh, there's a bit of, uh, the government has taken some steps, like for instance, I mean, decreasing the salaries of all ministers and some public CEOs by 30%. So there's a real direction and feel that the government is, is taking some steps. I think there was a big push for the government to go to the IMF. I think they've resisted that because the argument is that they, they know what should be done or what would be done once they go to IMF. So why shouldn't they do, why don't they, why don't they do it themselves? So I think they are trying to put all these businesses in place and avoid that formal approach to the IMF. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kwame. And I would like to thank uh, the four uh, panelists for the first uh, round. Second round uh, would like uh, to discuss uh, with you all uh, what are the future scenarios and what can the international uh, organization do uh, to support uh, these countries in, uh, in restarting uh, the recovery, whether uh, the restart of the recovery is a realistic scenario that we could aspire for, and also what those countries can do. Uh, beyond and to do really to uh, to resist to these external shocks and to uh, to be able to uh, advance uh, in their development uh, path. And I would like uh, to ask you uh, in your uh, minutes of inter I mean of discussion. So, so each one will have five minutes. Uh, to if you can allude to the role of China in the Mediterranean and Africa, as we see that China has been increasing dramatically uh, is, um, is that it's uh, uh, loans to Africa. Up, up to now, it's more than 150 billion, uh, if, I, if I remember the latest uh, numbers. 
and this also puts further strains on the uh, on the indebtedness situation of, of those countries. So if you have any uh, reaction uh, to this, uh, here I would like to start with uh, Cynthia. Many thanks, uh, Rim. You you're asking us very difficult questions. Let me try to to make uh, uh, maybe a couple of points. I mean, the, the first one about global coordination. I have to admit that I have become uh, um, rather uh, pessimistic on what uh, actually can be achieved. And the main reason is that uh, I believe that the geopolitical order has, has changed in a way that will never go back to the, to the previous situation. And uh, I, I think that this war has made some fractures which were already existing very clear. And uh, we will uh, uh, see the emergence of, uh, I think, different blocks. Uh, which now we tend to, to associate with Russia against Russia, with the West against the West. I think there are things which are a bit more nuanced, um, but it, it, it's clear that for different reasons, whether this is political affinity, whether this commercial interest or the objective to, to remain more, more neutral, uh, they will, we will see the creation of uh, uh, different blocks. If this is the case, the, the structure of international coordination that basically was defined in the uh, second uh, after the Second World, uh, World War, uh, basically the IMF, the World Bank, all the, the, the global organizations will find themselves working in a very hostile environment. It will be very difficult to take decision to use funds, which are basically pulled in from all these different sources to achieve common objectives if we do not have a convergence of values. This is, for me, it's, it's really the main concern. It's, it's, it's really at very high level. Um, I don't know how it, it, will, it will play in, uh, in terms of oper operationalization, but I see this really as, as a major challenge for the functioning of uh, international uh, organization. The second point if, uh, I would like to make is that uh, I mean, of, of course, um, we could still expect and hope that international organization can, can play a role. But I think, and this was highlighted basically by all speakers, that the, each and every country actually can start to make some strategic choice in the direction of increasing resilience. I think this is a message that came from all the speakers. And basically, one major lesson learned from uh, from the, the, the war and uh, the dependency from Russia, but also already from, from COVID, is that we need to, to strengthen the, the internal ab ability to, to produce or to find alternative uh, in a way that we are not too much dependent on one supplier. And I think a, a key strategy is it's really diversification. In, in a world where the, 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 the risks uh, are increasing, the exposure to shocks increase, basically the only thing we can do is uh, to increase diversification, but also to um, strengthen uh, some internal um, endowments or some, some internal capacities. Um, so this is, uh, um, I think, is of strategic importance. As Kwame said, in response to this shock, the war, but also uh, in a much more or longer perspective. And then a very uh, final point, uh, um, which is related to this, is, is really the idea of trade versus dependency. So we somehow moved to an environment until uh, five, six years ago, where basically we were all into um, how to increase globalization, how to uh, be part of, of trade, and now we risk to, to move into something which is completely opposite, whereby trade is uh, uh, set equal to dependency, and we basically uh, tend to, to close the doors. Uh, I, I think uh, we really need to, to realize what are the risks associated to trade and when this can create dependency, but also the, the risks of becoming protectionist. protectionist because basically, in, in the world of today, it's impossible uh, to basically close the links with the external world and uh, assuming that uh, each member state, each state, each na nation uh, can, uh, can do it alone. So uh, again, this is very broad, but it's, it's really a strike. Uh, a
a balanced strategic uh, in strategic choices. I will leave it here, but I'm, I'm happy to um, explain further. Thank you. Uh, this is very interesting, uh, since, Cynthia, because you, you put really uh, the finger on the future of uh, globalization. Uh, where are we going in terms of uh, cooperation uh, and uh, coordination? Is it on a global level or is it on a regional, uh, sub-regional level? But then if we move into different blocks, uh, what are the values that we are going to follow and which are the uh, minimum, I would say, common denominators between the blocks, mm -hmm. whether we could, uh, in fact, understand the different, uh, the different, uh, I would say, uh, 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 underpinning of those uh, blocks and what are those blocks. So there's a yeah. lot of uncertainty in that sense. Uh, of course, resilience is essential, uh, but then also there is one thing essential is the uh, use of, you know, the accumulation of buffers and the use of them in the uh, bad times. Uh, so the buffers, whatever, um, buffer economic buffers or uh, financial buffers, they have to be used. Uh, first, they have to be, uh, you know, accumulated over time in the good times. And then it reminds me of the whole debate of the uh, counter cyclical buffers in the banking sector. So you see, we need to think of macro cyclical uh, type of uh, buffers that can be used uh, in, the, uh, in the bad times, but also buff uh, buffers in, in terms of strategies, what to do in a situation where there is an external shock and where is a dry up in a way, or you know, uh, disruptions of the supply chains and also uh, in the supply uh, in, in, to, to, to ensure that this is happening. And yes, um, uh, the last point is diversification. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, to diversify the risk and to be able to manage it, I think this is essential. Um, but then this is one of the lessons that we, we, we are learning from all this uh, sequence of crisis that we've been living in. Um, I hope Moaz could hear us and we could hear him. Moaz, do you have anything to add on your, uh, on your discussion, on the discussion? I don't uh, see him. Yes, I see uh, him. Uh, for the first question about the, the, the role of the international institution, I, I think the priority is to, to improve the place of environment transition and uh, digital, digitalization uh, in their conditionality. For example, uh, the IMF uh, is uh, usually, uh, the conditionality is based in subsidies, uh, targeting in uh, reduced wage bill. But uh, if we introduce, uh, uh, if we improve the place of digitalization and environment for this digit digitalization, can reduce corruption, can combat the uh, informal sector, uh, on the other side, for uh, environment transition, uh, can reduce energy uh, shocks, uh, energy dependency. But for for, for the country, uh, I think the, the the priority or the first challenge and the main challenge is uh, to 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 improve uh, the, the 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 resilience. Uh, but, but because don't, the objective is to build, to, to build the, the economic uh, resilience, but uh, uh, with the loss of fiscal space, with the debt and sustainability, uh, this objective is not easy. Uh, I think an urgent need to, to, to consolidate public finance in order to, to improve fiscal space and to implement structural reform to, uh, to, to rise the potential growth. The second uh, objective for the country is to is the food resilience Mars, we are you are having same problems with internet. Uh, for example, for, for Tunisia, it's very challenging, uh, challenging stress, uh, similarly the climate. Uh, sorry, it's not clear. Uh, now, yes, let's try. <laughs> but, uh, Doc, I think the, the urgent need is to, to, to reform agriculture, 
sector uh, to encourage ecological uh, agriculture, to encourage the production uh, of wheat, to improve the food uh, storage capacity uh, for water stress, government could improve alternative option like desalinization uh, or modernization uh, wastewater uh, treatment. And uh, the third challenge is the energy resilience and uh, the objective is to improve the energy sovereignty, but uh, in the situation characterized by in, uh, in economics, uh, 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 Tunisia can diversify its energy resource and uh, accelerate its uh, application for low carbon economy, and uh, Tunisia don't an urgent need for greening for greening monetary policy and for greening fiscal policy. Thank you very much, oh. Moaz. And I think oh. uh, and, and I think it's to uh, invest in uh, internet infrastructure is very important as well. <laughs> so, okay, uh, let me move uh, straight to Nagla, please. Thank you, Reem. Uh, actually, I, I agree with all what had been said, Cynthia, actually, as uh, she said, she uh, uh, really pinpointed a very important point regarding the international support, you know, uh, bear in mind that most of the countries and the economies are having really high levels of debts, you know, so we cannot expect uh, too much of, um, of um, support at that level. And sometimes support is associated with uh, certain requirements that sometimes are not really suitable to the local local uh, uh, government policies or whatever. Resilient, of course, you know, policy, uh, physical and monetary policy should be really resilient to meet what we're, we're going uh, through. And I think the most important thing, you know, is uh, finding the balance between uh, dependency and the independency, because yes, you know, we don't want to be that much dependent on, on, on lots of things, you know, particularly food you know, to reach to a point that you don't have the sufficient food storage or whatever it is, this is a disaster by itself. But at the same time, there are different factors that are involved. It could be climate factor or um, uh, it's not suitable place to uh, uh, for such, uh, for wheat or whatever it is. So here it comes actually the regional, and I'm talking about the rear regional collaboration and building on certain edges. If we look at the continent of Africa and the MENA, you know, you will find a number of countries in Africa, they have the, the proper setting uh, in terms of climate uh, to actually increase uh, uh, their planting of wheat and grain and the blah, blah, blah. However, they might not have the latest technology, they might not have the needed funds, you know, to invest in uh, preparing all these lands and whatever. Here are actually the complementing parts that are there. It is not, um, it is not investment only for the sake of gaining uh, revenues and more whatever. No, these are complementing uh, life uh, continuity, you know, and uh, and maintaining uh, the poverty. So those who can supported by technology, by fertilizers, by whatever it is, and those who have the land. Here are actually the regional, the regional uh, 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 um, coordination should top the agendas of uh, different regions, you know, to look at where is our uh, 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 um, welfare, the welfare of our people, you know, where are we, how can we do it, you know, in collaboration with others. The very, the very important uh, point also, you know, definitely looking at renewable energy. Yes, this could take some time, but uh, all these uh, substitute of uh, energy and the reliance on oil and, and, and should take a real serious look at it, you know, uh, a very important point in short term uh, actions for the countries that are affected in where, where the economies are um, not in their best status. I think, yes, we have to all, all policies and government policies need to relook um, their export import balance, balance, you know, what's needed in terms of imports. So we should be essential and we should need it, you know, and we see how to do anything regarding export and here comes uh, 
um, the, the, the monetary policy to facilitate, you know, the access for all these substitute of imports, you know, and the risk mitigation tool as guarantee scheme, we are there. We are always there. We're ready. We adjust ourselves. We're very flexible, and uh, we have the needed level of um, uh, resilience that we can act immediately to whatever call is there. But this should come in 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 a policy approach. We started some here, and I think actually our region in general, they uh, they are uh, they, they 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 take they do take now serious acts uh, as they can. And we have to put underline and under as they can, you know, to meet all these consequences in terms of uh, substitute or um, in terms of looking at uh, maintaining the business and maintaining people over poverty line, you know, because we will look soon into a decrease, uh, or sorry, increase of uh, poverty, ratios people out of jobs or whatever it is. What do we expect? But I, I hope um, within within region and I'm looking, this is the time and I'll take what Cynthia said, you know, yes, globalization or semi-globalization, who said globalization could be good, but not an extreme globalization where I have to go, I don't know where to get a certain something. Why don't we look for this semi thing, regionalization or something like that, that we need to look at, you know, so this is my final point in that. Thank you very much, Nagla. Uh, Kwame? Hi, Doc. So I think for uh, for the first point, it was dealt with excellently. I don't need much to add much, just to hone in that. I think the digital agenda must be looked at seriously. On the second point about chi China and, and all that, I think Africa needs to collaborate on an agenda at the regional level or Africa-wide to know how the, the long-term dealings with China has, has to be. Because there's a, if you if you really pay attention, especially to Ghana, there's a lot of influence, and in the next ten years, a lot a lot will happen. So we need to respond in a collaborative manner to make sure that uh, we benefit. I mean, we cannot close our, our borders to China because there's significant reliance on them. And if, as I spoke earlier, another war or another challenge that we need to look out for is China, because if if you look at the key thing that happened with regards to freight charges uh, the last six months or so from China. It, it, it really increased cost across across uh, Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, this very uh, interesting discussion today. Uh, the takeaways are a lot, of course, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. So uh, we do not see um, a clear scenario on what's going to happen in the next month, that's very clear. Um, of course, one key determinant is the um, duration of the war. Uh, because, of course, uh, these uh, tits and tats between uh, the different players in the war is uh, uh, impacting negatively the world economy, particularly the countries that are dependent uh, on, uh, on 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 different uh, the different regions that uh, russia ukraine also europe uh, because of course if europe uh, growth is going down uh, is high risk of inflation so of course uh, the possibilities of investment foreign direct investments and uh, and also uh, development uh, overall will reduce because they have to be moved to other parts of the world and then uh, Obviously, this is uh, the, the, there will be, a, 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 I would say, maybe a gap in the, in the short run, but then in the medium uh, run, there will be other players who will fit the gap in some other parts of the world. And this might create uh, different types of interactions that we will have, uh, you know, or different players will have to deal with. Um, of course, uh, we are living in times uh, post I wouldn't say even post-pandemic because we are still living in the pandemic. Um, but then within the pandemics, within the uh, war uh, context, and also uh, moving into economic and financial crisis, um, the role of uh, resilience is essential, uh, not only to, to, to uh, I would say, to restart growth, but also to ensure survival. And this is, I, I, I hate to say it, 
uh, we are now moving into uh, how to ensure survival uh, within this very uncertain and very almost chaotic uh, context. Um, the third point is, um, I mean, of course, diversifying and reducing dependence uh, needs time and needs investment and needs uh, long-term strategies. Now, the countries that have started earlier, they will be in a much better uh, position to resist uh, any uh, major disruptions. Uh, now, the countries that are dependent financially on the markets, uh, food and uh, energy-wise to other suppliers, um, they will be uh, suffering much more than others. And the implications would be, uh, of course, as we know, social unrest, uh, more complexities, uh, more unemployment, and uh, of course, uh, the valve to exit from all of this is the migration. But where to migrate uh, if all the countries are are uh, living in the same context. Um, uh, we, we're adding to this also the long-term challenges, uh, which are uh, linked to the climate change, and I'm not going to dive into it um, in this webinar, but uh, one thing essential is to keep uh, cooperation, even at the regional level. It's very essential because, uh, I mean, proximity also means uh, that we, we, we need to try to cooperate as much as possible. Um, but again, uh, thank you all very much for this very uh, uh, interesting discussion. Uh, of course, I see that the future is a little bit uh, gloomy, uh, unfortunately. But then hopefully uh, there will be uh, solutions uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the war uh, in Ukraine. This is going to stop uh, as soon as possible. Um, Beyond this, I thank you all the panelists, uh, Cynthia, uh, Nagla, Moaz, and Kwame for this very informative discussion uh, at the Euro Mediterranean Economist Association and the SEPS uh, Policy Studies uh, webinar. Uh, of course, we will continue uh, these discussions. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, Ideas Lab will be also on Ukraine in June, uh, organized by SEPS. Uh, and uh, of course, there will be more insights uh, during these uh, meetings. Uh, but our next meeting would be on the 12th of uh, May. It's on uh, the post uh, declaration of the EU Africa Summit, what to do. Uh, now there is a lot to do uh, for Africa, for the Mediterranean. Uh, and I hope we are all part of the solution uh, for uh, our regions uh, and then uh, for more peace and prosperity. This is what we hope for. Thank you very much all. Uh, and then we will see you in next uh, webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Thank you very much. Many thanks to all. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, Reem. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Hopefully we'll get together when things are better. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs>